Turn with me to the second Corinthian epistle. And I want to go to chapter 5. And I want to begin with verse 17. Remembering that this, as is true of most of the New Testament, is written to members of the church, written to Christians on living the Christian life. In verse 17, he's concluding an argument, and he says, Therefore, which is based upon what I've already said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing or reckoning their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Paul would later say to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. We do no violence to the scriptures to simply say this, preach reconciliation because it is the word of reconciliation now what does that mean why is there a need for man to be reconciled to God well Romans 3 and verse 23 makes it clear all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death Romans 6 23 death there doesn't mean annihilation it doesn't mean going out of existence. It doesn't mean you're unconscious of your surroundings. It simply means you are separated from God. And your sin that you committed, for which you are responsible, have separated yourself from God. We, therefore, made as God created us, have the power of choice. We have our will. And as we will not to obey Him, then God remains the same. But we separate ourselves from Him. So the doctrine or the word of reconciliation means that here is a way that we can be back with God as though we never sinned. The word of reconciliation. The seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. The sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And as the writer of Hebrews said, now the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12. So when we speak of the means whereby God brings sinners back to Him, then there has to be some way sin's dealt with. There has to be some way that man doesn't have those sins counted against him anymore. And when you study the gospel system, you will see then that God has ordained such a way. Thus, Jesus would say while he was on this earth in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's exactly what he said in verse 49, or rather 19, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing or reckoning their trespasses unto them. That would be us, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now it ought to be understood here that when the us and the we are used, he's not saying every member of the church. God, through Christ by the Holy Spirit, delivered the gospel of Christ through the apostles. Thus, 
Acts 2 verse 42 speaks of the gospel system as the apostles' doctrine. And there was that period of time when the Holy Spirit was in men. We say today, if you want to know what the will of God is, read your New Testament. I guess to illustrate my point or to try to, in those days without any written New Testament, you could simply say, you want to know the will of Christ? Ask an apostle. Or later as they laid hands on people, asking those who had received miraculous gifts of prophecy and so on. But as they had these letters, such as this one I just read from, then they would have the knowledge that those letters gave them. And thus, God has never done for us what we could do for ourselves. And when it became that which could circulate among churches in words that we could read, then Paul would make it very clear when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my mystery or my understanding of the mystery of the gospel. Well... I now have the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, and I can study it, and I can know, I can read these inspired words that at one time was in inspired men, but now in an inspired book, for all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that's complete, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So we're interested in the statement where he says, Be ye reconciled. That means there's something man must do. A lot of people say you're saved by God. There's not a thing in the world you can do of yourself to be saved. Well, then why does he say, Be ye reconciled? And even denominational preachers have got it backwards at times when they'd say, God is reconciled to us. No, God didn't leave us. God has kept his promises flawlessly. Who left whom? We transgress His will, Romans 3.23. We sin, for that is the definition of sin, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, verse 4. And we left Him. So we must keep in mind, there is God's part in reconciliation, and there is man's part. And we want to study those things. May I also say, it's our prayer for all who are not reconciled to God, and I hope you'll be honest with yourself and listen to what I'm saying. If you're outside of Christ, if you're not reconciled to God, if you are yet guilty of your sins that have separated you from God, that's why we call them alien sins. They alienated us from God. The very first sin that a person committed alienated him from God. Thus, there are alien sins. Calvinism won't recognize that because they teach the false doctrine of when you're born, you inherited Adam's original sin. So they don't have anything like that. And that's wherein they're wrong. Because a man grows up and he reaches a stage as a child to where he is accountable to God for his actions. And the Bible says all have sinned. Thus, we have a responsibility and God has a responsibility. And these ambassadors of God, the apostles of Jesus Christ, unto them originally, first and foremost, was committed the word of reconciliation. So Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Now then we are ambassadors of Christ, or for Christ, as though God did beseech, beg, implore you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, there in the place of Christ, be you reconciled to God. Now, what does it mean to be in the place of Christ? That's what an ambassador does, sent from the United States government to any other government. They are the official means whereby any other government can learn the policy of the United States government. That may be when we travel somewhere, we say we're ambassadors of goodwill, but that just means we ought to be living right before anybody else It's not a, an American. But ambassador is one who has, and I've used this many times, so you might not remember it, who possesses, who in, is endowed with what is called plenipotentiary power. That's peculiar to an ambassador of one government to another. And the apostles were ambassadors from the court of heaven and Christ sitting on his throne at the right hand of God to all men on earth. 
Thus, the early church understood that, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles or ambassadors' teaching or doctrine. So they are the ones through whom God by Christ and the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit had revealed to them the will of Christ. Now, the early church had to learn that. So in this letter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by an apostle, he is saying God had a responsibility in drawing you to him as if you had never sinned. And man has a responsibility to cooperate with God according to what God says is your responsibility, our responsibility, to be reconciled to God. It's not a one side only or the other side only. It is a cooperative effort. It's like the church is commissioned of Christ to preach the gospel to every creature. Well, God is not going to come down as Jesus did, or he's not going to send angels down. That's to preach the gospel. That's the responsibility of the church. And God has ordained that we cooperate with him. I don't think we realize what a blessing and an obligation God has placed upon the spiritual body of Christ. That he would entrust the saved, saved by the gospel, Romans 1.16, as they believed and obeyed it, to carry it out to others who are lost. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, they're preaching the gospel, the power of God to save. They're preaching the word of reconciliation. Nobody's going to be reconciled to God and have an association with them as though they had never sinned, except that they know the word of reconciliation, except that they understand it, and that they fulfill their responsibility to God in the matter by complying with the mandates and principles of the gospel message. So... I ask now, with that comment, or those comments being made, are you in a reconciled state to God? Everybody needs to ask that question. Am I with God right now as though I'd never sinned? Am I still outside of the state of being reconciled to God? Does God see me as His faithful child. I want you to notice a little more about this. Because you remember on the day of Pentecost when those people heard the word, faith was created in them, and as believers they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pricked in their heart by the truth. And Peter took them as believers in Christ and told them in verse 38, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That means by His authority. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You can't come to the Father but by Him. His is the way of reconciliation. And man has no other hope. So when they were baptized, the Lord added them to His church. Acts 2, 41, 42, 47. Now, look what Paul had to say to a congregation of God's people, to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians 2.16. And that he might, here's our word, reconcile both. He's talking about you and Gentile who need salvation by the same means, the gospel, both unto God in one body by the cross. People regularly and half for years say, Church has nothing to do with our salvation. But I find here that when I'm reconciled to God through my belief and obedience to the gospel, that I'm reconciled in one body. So when a person is baptized into Christ, the Lord adds him to the church. Well, what's the church? Colossians 18 says that body, that one body. Ephesians 4 is the church. Nobody's reconciled to God outside of the church of our Lord. Not a soul. They're all estranged from God, still in their alien sins. And no human man-made church built upon the commandments and doctrines of men is authorized to save anybody. They don't even exist by the authority of Christ. They exist by their own authority. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men. And that won't get you anywhere but torment. So we see that the body of Christ, whereby and in which 
we are reconciled to God as though we had never sinned is the church. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Reconciliation is so important. If you've ever been around people who were estranged from one another, if you could, and it was possible, as Paul might say it this way, as much as life within me is, you might want to do all you can to see them reconciled. Now, it's interesting that Paul tells us, as he writes to Timothy, that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. What does a mediator do? He reconciles two estranged parties. Well, Christ is God, but Christ is also man. He can represent man to God, and he can represent God to man, for he is fully both and the only one like that. And the writer of Hebrews says he ever he liveth ever or ever liveth to make intercession for us, the church. Why? Because we've been reconciled to God. How were we reconciled to God? We were obedient to the gospel plan of salvation. And that brings us then in understanding of be reconciled, that one must understand the love of God. And listen, we know what John 3.16 says, but I don't know that many people know really what it means. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, you look at the last part of that verse. Should not perish. Does not mean He won't perish. But He should not if He's a believer. But it doesn't say belief in Christ only and that's all it takes to save you. But you can't be reconciled to God and not believe in Christ. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And thus Jesus would say to the Jews, as was pointed out not long ago in a message, except ye believe that I am He. Ye shall die in your sins. He is the way the truth, and the life. And no man comes of the Father but by Him. But by Him means by His gospel, the power of God to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16. The gospel that the church is commissioned to preach to every creature. And 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 sets out the basics of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen to this. When he says, God so loved the world, we're at that end of the sentence now, at the beginning of it. That's manifesting to us a love that, frankly, my mind just can't get around. That man who took the blessings of God and threw them back in his face, rebelled against him, and broke God's laws, God still loves us. And he loved us even while we were yet sinners. And that's what John's saying. How much did God love us? Well, He gave His only begotten, one-of-a-kind Son. And Christ Himself, uh, if you read the Philippian letter, you'll see this, realized as the second person of the Godhead and the executor of the Father's will that He must come to earth and be a man, suffer, bleed, and die if reconciliation was ever to take place. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now the responsibility slips over on man. That is, we must believe in Him. That's the beginning point. Because you see, if you really believe, have confidence and trust in Christ to save you, you will take Him at His word. These people say, oh, I believe Christ. He's the greatest thing under the sun. My Lord, my Savior, my King. But they're not cautious and careful to know what He says. And do what he requires. Their faith is vain. It's empty. It's worthless. Christ himself said, Why call you me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. So God's love is given despite man's sin, man's rebellion. 
Romans 5, 8, Paul wrote to the church in Rome saying, But God commendeth His love toward us. How does God commend His love to us? You know, when you commend somebody to somebody, there's something about that that you want the other person to know. And God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, when we were fighting against Him, denying Him, doing everything you read of the Gentiles did in Romans 1, and then what you read of that the Jews in a special relationship with Him did in rebellion, rebelling against Him constantly. He still in His divine providence showed His love for us in Christ's coming, being tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, being the sacrificial lamb who could go to the cross and not die for any sin he had done, but die on your behalf and my behalf and the behalf of all men so that they could be reconciled to God. And God's great love quickens or makes our souls alive. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. I wish I could plumb the depths of that with this mortal mind. Even when we were dead in sin, separated by our transgression, which we chose to do or not do as the case may be, sins of commission and omission, He hath made us alive. He has quickened us. But notice again, together we're with Christ. Together with Christ. And then He emphasizes, for by grace are you saved. It's God's favor that we don't deserve and cannot merit that He sent His only begotten Son. His love sent Him. And His love had Him do for us what we never could do for ourselves. But we could have faith in Him. We could respond in faithful obedience to show our love and appreciation for what He's given to us that we never could merit and we don't deserve. And hath raised us up together. I want you to think about that. He puts us in that. Christ was raised to the dead. Well, when we're baptized into Christ, we're raised to walk in the newness of life. That's how we began this study. And raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. Remember Ephesians 1, 3. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. We in the church are a privileged group of people. We have things that God does for us. He will not do for those outside of Christ or who have apostatized or those in certain sins for which they will not repent. That's an amazing thing. Heaven's on our side. All that's in heaven is on our side. All that God is, is on our side. Everything heaven can do for a free moral agent yet in the flesh on this earth, God has done. Now it's up to us to receive it on His terms. Because He knows better what I need than I do myself. I can remember as a child, and I don't know what it is, but medicines when you're little seem to taste worse than they do when you're grown. Or else you just got, <laughs> you got used to, to the bitter taste or whatever taste it is. But I can remember taking medicine and it was, seemed like an ordeal. You have to have two spoons of this. And my thought, that, that's awful. To take the first spoon and then I gagged it down and I got to take the second spoon and Mama's sitting there looking at me like you got me or the medicine to take so you better take the medicine and you would and you still didn't necessarily feel all that good because you're sick or you would be taking it in the first place but when you think about when you think about what God did for us to save us from our sins that we can never prove for ourselves. And you just read Isaiah 53 alone of what He underwent, our Lord. Then that's a spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. It means it's good for us. That erases the bad taste when I know it's good for me. It's what must be done. It's the remedy. There is no other remedy. You leave Christ, where do you go? 1 John 4.10, herein is love. Not that we love God, that's not it, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Christ solved the sin problem. 
When you preach the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, you preach the solution to sin's problem. In John 6, 40, Jesus said, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Here's a wonderful statement. And I will raise him up at the last day. Isn't that amazing? That's not the end of us. If we will but be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, then we know our labor is not in vain, empty, purposeless, worthless. Where? In the Lord. But we're reconciled to God in one body. Thus, in the state of reconciliation that all faithful children of God are in this one body, which is the church, which he added every one of us as new creatures when we were baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4 and verses 17 and 18. Then we have the hope, the expectation and the earnest desire to receive the resurrection from the dead, to die no more. In Acts 3, in verse 26, in the second recorded gospel sermon Luke gives us, we find this, Peter speaking, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. You see, that's how we are a new creature. Once our sins are wiped away by the blood of Christ, when we're baptized into his death, then we rise up with the resolve to live as the New Testament teaches, in grateful appreciation and love for what's been done for us. Now erase all of this from your life, and there is nothing but an eternal void of torment and a devil's hell that awaits. And sadly, most people will be there. In Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Paul said, But when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, now watch, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons or receive sonship. How does God deal with faithful members of the church? As children... Do we understand that? Well, even as finite parents, we ought to be able to. For how do you deal with your children as you love them? How do you work with them? How are you patient with them? How are you instructing them? How are you teaching them? What kind of an example are you setting before them? Well, just think. All of heaven operates that way for the Lord's family, which is His church, the body of Christ, the body of reconciliation. Now, he's told us exactly what we must do to be saved. And very quickly, I'm just going to show you what most here know. But maybe some of you haven't decided to obey it, but you ought to. And before I go into it, if you would go to heaven, you must do this. It is the manifestation of your faith in God for his love for you and Christ and his love for you as the way, the truth, and the life. You must have such a belief in Christ built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition or propositions that proves the deity of Christ and what He is, the Savior of the world. You must believe in Him. That's the beginning point. With such a confidence and trust built upon the truth of God's Word that you will receive that Word when it commands you to repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. And that means a breaking down of the old stubborn will that's typical of men. So that you'll say, not my will, but thine be done. And the rest of my life will be used in striving to do that. And you die to sin there, the actual practice of sin, the habitual life of sin. You die to it in repentance. And you obey Christ in willingness before men to confess your confidence, trust, belief, faith in God. Before them, you're not ashamed of him, for he's your only Savior, and you know it. There's no other hope. And when he asks, will you also go away? You'll say, like Peter, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. We know that thou art come from God. Having done that, obeyed it, now you're a candidate to have your sins washed away. 
to be baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that your sins might be remitted. So you can rise reconciled to God in that one body, free from sin, a babe in Christ, desiring the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now there it is. If you would be reconciled to God to have all your sin, no matter how long you've been in them or not, one sin separates. Have all that taken away so that in God's mind He sees somebody as though you had never sinned. For you see, you contacted the saving blood of Christ when you were baptized into His death because it was in His death where He shed His blood. Now what do you think about when I say those words? Where are you letting your mind go? Are you listening to them? Are the truths of those words entering into the depths of your heart? Are they causing you to see what you need to do? Because God's done everything. I'm announcing through His Word what He's done for you. But I'm also announcing from His Word what is already in your own Bible if you'll read it. Not original with me or any other human. What He's taught concerning being reconciled to Him. Just think, He's ordained a way to where men steeped in sin even as Paul said, by his sins, he was the chief of sinners. Can be reconciled to him, covered by the blood of Christ. Robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. Clean and acceptable. Looking forward to the day when heaven will be your home. As a child of God, does this not encourage you to be more determined to be living the reconciled life in the one body, which is the church? That you not let yourself get off into sin, failure to study the Bible, and to pray, to be all involved in this world. You know, everything about this present world is designed and Satan uses it to pull you away from the most important. That is, seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Brethren, I am of an alien kingdom to this world. But I'm a citizen of it. And when all of this world has passed and all of its kingdoms and nations and governments have long gone, those who live their lives faithful here will shine as the sun in their glorified bodies as they walk with the Lamb, far from sin in a place of sin and the consequences of sin, far beyond what we tussle with all day long every day here. The body of reconciliation. Have you been reconciled to God? And are you faithful to Him? If you need to repent of sins as a child of God who sinned, we urge you to do that. We beg it that you remember about all these things that reconciled you to God when you first heard the gospel and obeyed it. Confess those sins. Pray God for forgiveness. Just think, heaven stands right now. If you could see the skies as it were, as we want to say, roll back. What would heaven be doing now? Just this congregation and just at this time. My God and the Christ would be hoping you would respond to the gospel truth. They're as real as we see one another now, but we see one another materially. They spiritually. So the great invitation is offered. Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Why reject that? Why turn it down? When we sing the invitation song, words are going to be in there that's going to urge you to act upon what I've been saying. And what I've been saying is in your own Bible. Don't reject it. Because every time you reject it, it makes it easier than next time to reject it. And you sear your conscience if you don't watch out. So that nothing godly appeals to you. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.